Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest with us. Today we have Adrienne Titchi. She is here today to actually tell us about what she does. It's remarkable. You're going to love her story. So I'm going to just give you the floor because I want everybody to know what you do because you help so many people. And I think everybody should learn a little about you and what you do. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Stacy, for having me on today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so what I do is uh, my husband and I have created a recovery residence community in our hometown of Delray Beach, Florida, where people that are just out of treatment for drugs and alcohol come uh, for about our minimum commitment is six months, but mm -hmm. um, we have most people staying for 18 months. Okay. And just to get, um, it, it's people from all walks of life, but uh, insurance doesn't cover services for housing. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a self-pay, but we do have several different programs uh, for people to come and, and really start their recovery journey on the right foot. We are kind of in a recovery bubble here in Delray mm -hmm. Beach. We have 70,000 people in the town, but 20% of our, our population is in recovery. Okay. So um, we have a lot of 12-step meetings and a lot of treatment centers and a lot of different facilities. And so that makes it very easy to get, get help here. You know, addiction is is very prevalent in our society, and you know, people don't realize that it just doesn't affect the person. It affects everyone around them. It affects the people they love. It affects them, and it's very hard when you become addicted to a drug, or a, or a substance. You know, to um, actually get out of that addiction because you have to change your whole life and you have to yes. stay committed to live in a healthy life. And, you know, I know it's a, it's a lifetime commitment, but I always call it a lifestyle change. Cause I, I think that lifestyle commitment sounds too harsh of a word, but you know, <laughs> it, it, but it, 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 you know, it, it, addiction will eventually can kill a person. And I've known many people Sadly, it, it has, or even if, even if you survive it, you're not living life to your full potential. And, you know, how, no. you know, what would you say to people who, you know, know they have a problem, you know, and they want, they want help, but they just don't, they might be embarrassed or they're afraid to, you know, ask for the help, you know, what would be step one? How would you get them to kind of come out of that hole and actually reach out for some help? Well, that's um, that's a great question because a lot of people, I think, today are are posing that question to themselves. You know, might I have a problem? Mm -hmm. um, particularly after COVID nineteen, because yeah. what that did was overnight, all but four states relaxed their liquor license so that you could get liquor delivered to your house. Oh, wow. that was done overnight, and um, that everybody uh, knows that the liquor stores were open, but, but not a lot of people understood that that was a policy decision Yeah, because if people just quit alcohol, cold Turkey, they'll go have seizures. Right. And so they need a medical detox and they needed the beds for COVID quite honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they made a policy decision, not just the United States, but a lot of countries made a decision to keep the alcohol flowing. And, and, uh, obviously we were in an increased stress situation. Yeah and nowhere to go mm -hmm. and so that uh a lot of people have accidentally become addicted what i call accidental alcoholism or accidental addiction yeah and I, I so that. Mm -hmm. the first step i would say is reach out um there's a definitely different 12-step groups and there's other support groups that are non-12-step yeah. Um, I would do a Google search. Um, even if you, you start doing a Google search, like how do I know if I have an alcohol use disorder? Right. And get some resources because you can't do this alone. Yes. Um, it's very, very, very difficult to, for someone to kick this kind of an addiction. Uh, and, and today addiction can be a substance, but it also can be a process disorder. We yeah. have people uh, with screen, dis uh, screen addiction. Um, we have people with gambling. 
addiction and, yes. and gambling addiction is re really bad. I mean, that's yeah. uh, that those people, those, those loan sharks collect on their money and in oh, not, yeah. not nice ways. Um, but the first thing to do is to recognize that it's a problem because yes. if you recognize it's a problem, you can, there are so many ways to get help today. There's treatment, there's an employee assistance program at your company. Right. Um, it's the stigma around it is, is getting less and less. Yes. And it's more important to get help than, you know, we have a saying in, in the rooms that you can't save your face and your rear end at the same time. Right. Exactly. And I kind of like that you mentioned that you can't do it on your own because you, you really can't, you know, mm -hmm. I find that, you know, you know, working when I was younger in a rehab that, you know, support groups and having, you know, AA meetings or having, you know, um, ad, you know, addiction meetings, you know, for people who had substance abuse or just having mm -hmm. big support groups where you would have, you know, 15, 20 people at a time, you know, help because people were actually able to share and, and be, and also get the support. I understand what you're going through, you know, right. It's a lot, I think, which is a lot. They need to know that they're not, that they're not alone. Yes. That this is not, um, a situation that they have to do this on their own. They can have people walk every step of the way with them. And what we also try to do, um, with recovery comes home is connect the families who are affected by addiction as they heal together. Right. Because you've got your person who's gone off here to rehab. Right. Yes. And, and you're the family back at home. It's a very awkward situation after a month to have them back. Yeah. Yes. You know, and people can be walking on eggshells or, you know, afraid to hurt feelings. And so we really try to get the lines of communication open and going with the family and, and understanding that the family has a lot of resentments and frustration built up at, at their person. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's very tough to live with someone that has an addiction, you know, because sometimes that person can hurt you emotionally, you know, and, and in some sadly cases, even physically, and, you know, you're going to have that resentment, that anger, you know, and it's something that you have to either decide to walk away from or decide to work together and communication is key and learn how to overcome and move forward. And, you know, that's, that's going to take both parts, I think, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Because the moving forward, you have to understand, like if somebody has been on drugs for a few years, it could take their brain a little bit to start functioning normally. Right. So right. you need, you need those other people around you to help you go like, okay, um, I'm not crazy. I don't need to do this all at once, you know? Yeah. Uh, but there are some things like after treatment, there's some things you can do to safeguard your recovery. Right. So creating a stellar support group is the first of those, I'd say, you know, get yourself uh, an accountability partner. Right. You know, tell people, Hey, look, I'm, I'm trying to do life without alcohol. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying to live uh, a sober lifestyle and there's, believe it or not, like there, it's not just addicts anymore that are living a sober lifestyle. It's a right. lot of people, it is. whether they can't take uh, alcohol because they take medications or they just don't want to drink anymore. Yeah. You know, for a person that's not an alcoholic and is drinking socially after a while, you know, especially during COVID, cause that's when I saw my friends and, and even me having a glass of wine, you know, more than usual, you know, yeah. we ate and we drank, we ate and we ate drank, and you know? we drank. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, and the, the two times a week going out with friends turned into a box of wine, a box of wine and 15 extra pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't help you with that one, but <laughs> I hear you. I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm about 20 pounds up after COVID too. <laughs> You know, like before the conversation, you know, well, before we, I get to the next question, I just want to ask one quick question is, so when you come home, let's say you have toxic friends, you know, those people that you were enjoying doing drugs or alcohol with those people that were around you that were egging you on do more, yeah. do more, 
So what do these people have to come home to? Do they do they have to start realizing that, okay, there are certain people in my life that are toxic and I have to just learn to let go, maybe make new friends, maybe, you know, and just, you know, not dislike them, but keep my distance from them. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, the people, places and things is a big topic in addiction recovery because that is precisely what happens. You imagine if you lost your best customer, that's right. what the dealer is thinking. And so there, there's even a, a bar here in town that unfortunately will take the white chip that you get from an AA meeting right. and give you a free drink with it. Oh, really? So there are people everywhere that are going to be and in fact, I get that too, because I don't drink because I have pancreatitis. Yeah. And when, when, you t when you tell people that, they understand, but they forget and they want you to drink with them. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like, well, it's, it's not, not fun it, unless you have a group of people with you doing it with you, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'd say, um, so the first thing is is to create that support system that is healthy. And, and I do think that means excluding toxic people. Sometimes you can't help it because you're going back into a toxic environment that you were in. Yeah. And that makes it very difficult. I would think it makes it very, very difficult. So having these meetings, uh, like we said, whether it's a 12 step or another type of, uh, meeting, there's smart recovery, there's save ourselves. There's, um, even moderation management has a group. You That's know, good. if you just want to cut down uh, and not cut it all out, you know, um, it's it's better to get and make new friends and get and make new supports without question. And if you have those environments where you have a family that, you know, might be toxic, maybe it's good to go for therapy, too, you think? Yeah, we have a lot of our people that are dual diagnosed, mm -hmm. um, which means they have they could have schizoaffective or bipolar or, and so yes, a therapist and also a psychiatrist sometimes, because as we were talking about earlier, sometimes medication is necessary and, right. and that people have underlying conditions. Uh, we actually had a, a boy that was autistic and he's doing quite well now, oh, that's um, good. but he was autistic and uh, addicted. He's actually probably more Asperger's high functioning, right? but, um, he's doing really good. And, and we also have like a, a 75 year old guy in right now, you mm -hmm. know, who it's just, it cracks you up that our oldest resident was 82. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know what, if it, cause I'm not in the program. Right. So yeah. I said to my husband, I said, you know, if it were me and I was 82, I think I'd probably make a different choice. <laughs> I'd be like 82. I don't think that's time to get sober. <laughs> But he's doing quite well, quite, quite well, too. Oh, that's good. You know, I I also, you know, we were talking about earlier in our conversation that I, I just want to bring up is that sometimes I think a lot of doctors in our society are a little bit too happy when it comes to writing prescriptions. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example. My mother had um, some surgery done on her tooth. So the doctor gave her a prescription for pain. He gave her opioids. So she comes wow. home and she, uh, she's telling me, oh, I got opioids. And I'm like, what? You know, and she's like, oh, well, he gave it to me for pain, and especially the older generation. They some, a lot of times they tend to just do whatever the doctor says. You know, they don't. Yes, you're don't. so right. And I was like, mom, you, you can't, you know, you can't, um, you know, do that. I said, you know, those are very addictive, you know. And then, you know, um, even my, and my son said, you know, to him, to her in a, in a jokingly way, yeah, college students will get it on the black market for $10 a pill. He said, because they want to stay up, you know, and they, and, and they, you know, and it's like, you know, I think doctors really have to, to really, you know, consider what they're writing out for their patients and yeah. the possibilities of what it could do to them in the future. You know, there are so many people that have become addicted to opioids and, and there are people on the street. And a lot of times too, people start with one drug and they go up the line. It's like a pyramid thing. That's right. You know, it, it'll go to alcohol, then it'll go to marijuana, then it'll go to cocaine, then it'll make its way up. And then eventually some people will try heroin and then you're just 
gone. You know, even with cocaine, you're just gone. You know, it's very hard to get off those type of drugs. And these people end up, their lives are just, you know, just and what's what's killing everyone right now is fentanyl. Yes. Yes. And so it's coming from Mexico. It's an it's a uh it's not the fentanyl that the doctor prescribes. It's yeah. kind of a a changed version of that that they cook up in Mexico and and it's coming over the border. We know where it's coming from, but um, we have, you know, I, I don't even, I can't even tell you how many people that we, that were lodge alumni that we've yeah. lost now from overdose to due to fentanyl. Cause it's, I don't even call it overdose anymore. I call it poisoning because yeah. they put, they put it in everything. It, you're not even getting, if you buy cocaine today on the street, you're getting 20% cocaine of probably 40% fentanyl. Wow. and 40% filler. And from what I understand, you just need a little bit of fat yeah, just to, to kill you, to kill you, you know, and, and, you know, it's sad because I saw, I think it was on TV. There was a, a woman and her, her son tried marijuana and he was one of those, he was doing really well in school. Good kid, mm -hmm. never got in trouble. And he did the pot and then he it had fentanyl in it and he died in the hospital he was rushed to the hospital and he died. And, you know, the parents that were devastated, the family was devastated just from that fentanyl. You know, these kids, these adults, they're getting drugs. They don't know where it's coming from. And they don't realize that anything could be laced with anything. That's well, so it could be even be as simple as like your kid saying to their friend, I have a headache and their friend pulling out a pill that they got on the black market and you don't you really today have to get something from your mom or dad or yeah. a prescription bottle. Right. And even some of those, you know, they, and even those, like you said, they overprescribe. Yeah. Totally overprescribing. I know. And it's, yeah. I had a family member that, that tried a, they gave him a medication and he had an adverse effect and it destroyed his kidneys and he had to go on dialysis, you know? And oh my gosh. So it's like, you know, you have to be very careful with medication, you know, and doctors really should be very careful what they prescribe too, you know? And like I said, I'm all for, you know, I, I take medication for my illness, you know, I'm all for medication. But, you know, I think we have to realize if we could help the person without going to medication, we should try at least, I think, you know, we could try because we can always we can always introduce the medication, yes. you know, but um, a lot of people in recovery really don't want to take any type of medication. Right. Um, and and that's understandable, you know, especially because. Uh, not not even just with the fentanyl thing, but even with the regular pharmaceuticals. I don't know how it is where you live, but where I live in Florida, it's like a commercial about a, a, a drug will come yeah. on. And then an attorney commercial will come on and say, oh, if you took Vyvanse or what, you know, yeah, whatever, with a class action lawsuit, call this number. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's that's pretty crazy. It is crazy. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, for people who are going for help, what what would be the biggest suggestion when they come out of rehab to, to be able to stay sober, to be able to live a happy and healthy life? You know, what suggestions do you usually, you know, or what things do you usually tell them to encourage them to, so they stay on the right track and they don't slip? So we, we tell them to, um, to get that support group, that stellar support group. And that includes friends and family. It includes going to a, a meeting to address your um, addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, it includes just keeping yourself busy. Yeah. Um, a lot of people use a playlist to mm -hmm. relax, you know, or to, yes. to get to change their mood right. instead of a drug. Um, I'd say you get your priorities in order too, you know, yeah. the, um, you, the recovery has to come first and you have to fit <laughs> you have to fit your life into recovery, not yes. recovery into your life. You have to, right. you know, um, in fact, my husband, um, when I first met him, I thought it was hilarious that he would plan his travel around where the meetings were. Oh, really? That yeah. Makes and, sense. and he still does. 
Um, but I was like, so you plan your vacations, you know, around the meeting times and like, but, um, now when we travel, I go with him and, and it's such a delight to see these people that he's seen yeah, all of these years and, um, and see them doing well too. You know, it's very encouraging. Um, I would say another thing is spend time in service. Mm -hmm. You can always help somebody with one day. Right. The person that, you know what I mean? Like you can always, whether it's giving them a ride somewhere to a meeting, um, whether it's going out to lunch and talking recovery for a little bit, um, you you also need to deal with the resistance because there's, there's, there, with addiction, there is the possibility of relapse. Oh yeah. The temptation will always be there. It's learn how to, you know, deal with that temptation and how to say no, how to put And, the- and if you do relapse, say I'm coming right back, you know, I'm not, yes. I don't need to stay out there for, for five more years because I made one slip up. Right. Don't beat yourself over the head, you know? Yeah. We're humans. We're not perfect. Sometimes things happen, but you know what? If you just get right back on track and keep, keep chugging along and, you know, you know what you want, you know, what you, what's best for you and and keep trying to stay on that road, I would think. Yeah. And the last thing that I would say is, um, you know, it helps to live clean and sober minded. Yes. Right. Just as a general practice, because like I said, I don't drink, but I also, I practice the 12 steps. Yeah in my life on a daily basis. I don't work any steps with anybody because I'm not in a program, but, but I mean, certainly I can um, admit that, that my chronic illness has made my life unmanageable. Right. And then I can, I can say a higher power uh, restored me to sanity. Right. And And you go through the steps and, and you learn to, live them by admitting your character defects and and working on them and, and, and going and making those amends to people, which, which is more than I'm sorry. Yeah. An amend is like, you know, I, here's the situation I was in. Here's what I've done about it. And I'd like to, you know, create a new relationship going forward. Right. And, and sometimes people will be up for that. And sometimes you've burned too many bridges. Exactly. And it's funny you say that because like I incorporated the 12 steps into my life because even though I'm not an alcoholic or a drug addict, it applies to me and my life mm-hmm. and having an illness. It actually going by those 12 steps actually helps me be a better person. And, you know, yeah, you've, I mean, just talking to you for the short time with what you've been through as well. I can't imagine your situation. I can, but I can, I know it, being around the medical community your whole life is not a is, is not a picnic not <laughs> no it's not fun you've got a phenomenal attitude <laughs> thank you so do you so do you now if people want to contact you where can where can they go and I know you have a sign in the back but let people know exactly what where they can go to contact you and you know and even if they don't live in the Delray area I'm sure you have areas you know and and names that you could suggest to people that you know in their area you could direct them in the right place so where should they go if they need help and and they see this and they they want to contact you because they need help and they just don't know where to go Sure. Our website is recoverycomeshome.com, which is all spelled out. Um, and they can, there's contact us information right up there. Um, the, with the recovery comes home, we can actually work with people that are not in our local area, but there will be some people that have to go after treatment to our recovery residents homes Mm -hmm. to, you know, to just learn how, to live life again sober. And I actually know a lot of recovery recovered addicts that actually when they did go to um rehab, they actually went out of state. They went, you know, and they went to different they didn't care where it was. They just they looked where they knew they would get the right help, you know. Yeah, most of our residents are out of state. Hardly anybody in in residence with us lives in Florida. 
Honestly, if I was going to rehab, I wouldn't mind looking out the window and seeing palm trees every day, you know, especially yeah. in Del Rey, you know. <laughs> exactly. It's, I think it's, um, I think it's 75 here today. Sorry for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to like Del Rey. I've been there several times. I, I like it. So <laughs> it's a great, it's a great city and it really is a Mecca of recovery, but you don't know that when you're here in the city. Right. So it's not like it's some, um, we're all um, institutionalized down here. Yeah. Delray is a lovely city. It's a 70,000 people, um, has a great beach. You know, our, our recovery residences are 1.3 miles from the beach. Mm -hmm. People go to the beach meeting. There's a beach meeting at 7 a.m. every morning. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, yeah, we have some amenities, certainly, here in Florida that other places don't, don't have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's been such a pleasure, Adrian, to have you on the show and I'd love to have you come back on my show and we could talk more about, you know, addiction and help people, you know, learn, you know, the steps of recovery and learn how to improve their lives. And I, I, I thank you so much for what you're doing. And, you know, I'd love to have you even on the show to tell your story and to share what you went through, because before that we were talking, you know, you shared a lot about your own, your own challenges in your life. And I think people would benefit benefit to just hear your story and to hear how you, you know, accomplished, you know, your challenges in life and how you didn't let your obstacles, you know, overcome you. Or do, or like you, same as you or define you, right? Yes, exactly. You know, I think yeah. if, if you really want change in your life, if you're tired of living the life you're living, if you want to better yourself, you know, anyone could, you know, make their dreams a reality. You just have to want it bad enough. And if you want it bad enough, anything is possible. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's been such a delight talking yes. to you. Same here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I look forward to speaking with you soon. Okay. Thanks, Stacy. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.